The title of this year's school is The Search for Truth, The Rising of the Spiritual Phoenix. The phoenix symbolizes the ability of the human personality to extricate itself from mundane, materialistic circumstance and to be elevated to a spiritual level of being whereby it is infused by the energies of the soul or higher self. The phoenix, rising from the ashes of its demise as a self-centered personality and soaring towards the sun, a symbol of its true and immortal nature. The phoenix was used as a symbol by the medieval alchemists. It represented the culmination of their great work, whereby the base metal of the transient, corruptible human personality undergoes a metamorphosis into the shining, radiant, eternal, incorruptible gold of the soul. Carl Jung was heavily influenced by the symbolism depicted in the various stages of the alchemical process. He was also influenced by the earlier related practices of Gnosticism, the symbolism of myth, and various other metaphysical teachings derived from both Occidental and Oriental sources. Jung himself described the spiritual path and the means by which one may successfully traverse this in this concept of individuation, the objective here being that of wholeness or integration, whereby the conscious and the unconscious elements of the human psyche, including the soul or higher self, are unified. And in this talk, we're going to consider the archetypal process of spiritual transformation and certain methods which can assist us towards effecting this, these methods being general, applicable to all of us. Theosophy informs us that in essence we are indivisible sparks of a divine flame known as monads. The monads, we see at the top here, the monads reside on the upper levels of consciousness of a vast evolutionary scheme. The monad possesses qualities of ultimate being, pure consciousness, and bliss. In the earlier Vedanta teachings, these were referred to as Sat, Chith, and Ananda. The soul or higher self, which we witness below, is but a reflection of the monad, serving as its instrument upon the planes of consciousness below it. The soul is seeking to attain a complete form of consciousness, whereby it can respond to every vibration of life surrounding it on each and every level of existence. This process involves a series of many lives in human form upon what is commonly referred to as the wheel of rebirth. It is only upon successfully learning every experience in human form that we are freed from the need to incarnate. We are then released from the wheel of rebirth, which has served its purpose to unfold the symbolic flower of the soul. This enables the monad to obtain its objective throughout its long evolutionary sojourn of acquiring spiritual staying power, this being the, abil the ability to radiate and express its hitherto latent qualities, despite the many challenges and constrictions imposed upon it by physical incarnation and all that this process entails. At a certain stage of the monad's evolutionary journey, after many human incarnations, we experience what the wisdom teachings refer to as divine unrest. This is where the transient affairs of life in the physical world and its associated materialism no longer satisfy or sustain us. A saturation point has been reached in terms of that which the soul is seeking to gain through physical incarnation. It is then that the spiritual path beckons. The great 20th century student of myth, Joseph Campbell, embraced Jung's ideas in relation to the dynamics of the human psyche. He illustrated how the various myths of our world represent a single story of humanity and, and our strivings towards realizing our divine potential. Campbell em emphasized that every myth is psychologically symbolic and its narratives and images are not to be assumed as literal, but rather to be read as metaphors. 
He adopted a comparative approach towards interpreting the symbolism of myth, perceiving a common pattern underlying its narrative elements. He described this as the hero's journey. In his classic work, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, Campbell illustrates how the heroes of myth respond to what he describes as the call to adventure. They then embark upon their quest. They leave behind the entanglements of everyday life in pursuit of spiritual initiation. They venture forth into distant and dangerous land, uncharted territory, which symbolizes the realms of the unconscious psyche, which we must explore when we tread the spiritual path. It is here that the hero encounters many tests and trials which determine their right to proceed further and ultimately to attain their goal. Campbell demonstrates that when initiation is attained, the hero must then return to the rank and file of humanity as a transfigured individual, offering the lessons of their illumination to others as an act of spiritual service. Upon our own islands, we find the quest for the grail, this being an aspect of Celtic myth, which was later infused by teachings of mystical Christianity. The symbolism of this myth beautifully illustrates the evolutionary journey which leads to the source of our being. After obtaining a partial vision of the grail, which is a symbol for the soul or higher self, the Knights of Camelot leave behind their noble and honorable lives to quest for the grail. Just as when we awaken to the truth of our being, the fact that we are a soul in a body, we are here to develop and express its qualities. The affairs of the outer world are no longer the same. Life is never quite the same. We are aware of this subjective factor, which Jung called the self, this higher integrating factor within the psyche, which we must strive towards accessing and expressing its qualities in the outer world. The knights enter the forest adventurous. This is a symbol for the inner world, the subjective realms of the psyche, in pursuit of the grail. After encountering many challenges, the grail is attained, and the successful knight is then able to heal the fisher king, or maimed king, who has been wounded by a blow known as the Dolores Stroke, which renders him as impotent. The incapacity of the Grail King affects the fertility of the land. No, nothing will grow, there are no rivers. It becomes a barren wasteland. And it is only upon the achievement of the Grail that the King may be healed, the wasteland restored, where the waters then flow to irrigate and replenish the land, and nature can express its full splendor. The maimed king is a symbol for our spiritual essence, the monad, which is effectively wounded or handicapped through incarnation and matter. And the challenges we tread the path to attain the grail of the soul or higher self is for us to become an effective instrument of spiritual expression where we are able to access and express our latent divine qualities. In theosophy, we symbolize the spiritual path as a mountainous ascent. We refer to this as a mountain of initiation. The ascent of the cliff face of this symbolic mountain is a most arduous and challenging process. And when we undertake this particular route, symbolic route, of course, we compact the learning experiences of many lives into a short few. Just as the mountaineer is prepared to persist in the face of inclement circumstances, such as freezing cold temperatures, raging blizzards, so we must persevere in our spiritual endeavors in the knowledge that our efforts here are not only of benefit to ourselves, but to humanity and to the planetary consciousness as a whole. And when we tread the path, we must accept and face any situation in life which confronts us as the soul seeks to test our reliability as its spiritual instrument, whilst also seeking to offload greater amounts of karma so that we may be freed towards acts of greater spiritual service. The astrological sign which rules spiritual initiation 
is that of Capricorn. And in a manner akin to the mountain goat, which we see here, there will be, there will be times in our life when we are challenged towards symbolically clinging on to a narrow precipice of the mountain whilst all around us is crumbling. The sign of Capricorn and its ruling planet Saturn rule patience and endurance, burdens, difficulties, long delays, isolation, responsibility, but also success of an enduring nature, spiritual success. These are the hallmarks of the spiritual initiate in the form of the qualities which they demonstrate and the experiences which they have undergone. Capricorn and Saturn also rule synthesis and personality integration, which is a most necessary requirement if we are to make any sort of serious headway along the spiritual path. For those of you who study astrology, you will know that each of the signs possesses a key phrase the one associated with Capricorn and initiation is that of I use. And when we tread the path, we must utilize our various experiences in life, both in the outer world and those of a subjective nature. Use these towards affecting personality integration so that we may attune to the higher self and be infused by its energies. The Italian psychiatrist Roberto Assagioli described the archetypal process of spiritual transformation in his concept of psychosynthesis, whereby one is seeking to attain what he called self-realization. As a means of affecting psychosynthesis, the individual treading the path seeks to purify and integrate the components of their personality what theosophy describes as the mental, astral and physical bodies. These are integrated into a coherent structure so that the soul may then infuse the personality with its energies and qualities. And personality integration is a most necessary requirement when we tread the path. In this way, our mind, emotions and body function as one. We are thereby no longer distracted from our spiritual purpose by the transitory affairs of the external world, nor are we bound to it by, by our attachments and desires, but rather we are able to operate in conscious cooperation with the higher self. Psychosynthesis entails our existing personality or ego structure with its various attitudes, predispositions, complexes, desires and attachments and so on, being effectively deconstructed and reassembled at a higher point of consciousness. This allows us to function in an integrated manner where we are safely and successfully energized by the soul. Of course, there are parallels with this in Jung's concept of individuation. In theosophy, I would relate this particularly to what we describe as the third initiation, whereby a fully integrated personality, being stable under all situations of involvement with the material world, can operate as a, an effective instrument of the soul. The soul having learnt all the necessary lessons upon the various rounds of the zodiacal wheel, having climbed the symbolic mountain of initiation. Such a personality has been transfigured into a spiritual instrument and is now free to work in accordance with the divine or evolutionary plan. This process is symbolized in classical myth by the birth of the sun god Apollo and his twin sister, the moon goddess Artemis. Apollo and Artemis were fathered by Zeus, the king of the Olympian pantheon of gods, whilst their mother was Leto. Hera, the jealous wife of Zeus, would not allow Leto to give birth on stable land. She was required to reach the floating island of Delos. And this was very challenging. There were very strong undercurrents surrounding the island. However, Leto was able to, to reach Delos and give birth to the twins. Upon giving, Leto giving birth, Zeus then secured the island to the bottom of the ocean. So let's look at the symbolism of this myth 
I deliberately chose a myth of a female giving birth, a symbol of divine qualities, because as has been pointed out to me in previous lectures by particularly assertive women, a lot of hero myths have a cultural bias. So I've chosen one of a female <laughs> giving birth here. So we have Zeus as a divine principle, the monad, seeking expression in matter, whilst his consort, the jealous Hera, symbolizes the dynamics and processes of creation, and therefore the challenges that incarnation in matter presents. However, the trials and tribulations associated with this which we experience within the symbolic realm of the goddess are a necessary part of our evolutionary journey as he enable the monad to obtain its objective of spiritual staying power, whereby it may radiate and express its hitherto latent qualities. When this is achieved, one may perceive what Campbell described as the secrets of the goddess, the secrets of life itself which are only revealed to those who are able to prove themselves worthy, who are able to transcend her powers of Maya or illusion. We view Leto here then as a symbol for the personality seeking to give expression to its innate spiritual qualities. Delos is a floating island, it is not a rigid structure. This symbolizes the fact that when we tread the path, we must be fluid and adaptable as a means of allowing the soul to infuse us with its energies. A rigid ego structure is unable to access the energies of the higher being. And Delos is difficult to reach due to strong undercurrents. And this serves to warn us of the challenges and the danger inherent in the process of psychosynthesis, whereby we, when we open up to the energies of the unconscious, it is particularly challenging. As Madame Blavatsky said, when one treads a path, all that is good and all that is evil surface. Of course, the energies of the unconscious are commonly symbolized as a sea or as an ocean. The birth of Apollo represents the coming forth of the solar or spiritual principle from within, whilst his twin Artemis personifies the power of nature and the energies inherent within creation, including the forces of the unconscious, which in this case are symbolized by a forest over which she holds dominion. Artemis is a chaste goddess. This represents a requirement for purification of the personality if we are to gain access to the secrets of the goddess. And this may only occur when we have successfully undertaken the disciplines, overcome the challenges of treading the spiritual path. Hesiod stated that Apollo was born clutching a golden sword. The double-edged nature of the sword is a symbol for the personality which is able to function simultaneously both in the outer and inner worlds. My mentor Douglas Baker would often quote the esoteric maxim, not that we should learn to live in this world less, but in both worlds more. And this represents a great challenge to us, but it is an essential one if we are to, to integrate our mind, body and emotion and the associated elements of our character into a single sovereign entity which functions as a spiritual instrument. So Zeus secures the island of Delos to the ocean bed, symbolizing the completion of the process of psychosynthesis, where the integrated personality is stable amidst the forces of the unconscious, here represented by the ocean, stable and infused by the energies of the soul. And when we tread the spiritual path, it's important to be aware that the journey is the goal. It is the experiences that we undergo as we tread the path that result in expansions of our consciousness. I chose uh, this uh, vase of the adventures of Theseus. You can see him in the center overcoming the Minotaur. And on the outside, he's, uh, He's outwitting or overcoming various villains uh, which symbolize different aspects of the human psyche, particular requirements if we are to successfully tread the path. These villains uh, represented obstacles towards him accessing the energies of the underworld, another symbol for the unconscious. 
bearing in mind that the Romans called the god of the unconscious Pluto, symbolizing the spiritual riches found within. The soul, of course, incarnates for the purpose of unfolding its latent qualities. It chooses appropriate circumstances within which we, as personalities, may develop and grow as an effective spiritual instrument. It is therefore appropriate for us to view our present situation in life from such a perspective, to accept what is given to us, responding to life's challenges with courage, resilience and fortitude. And on our spiritual journey, we, as personalities, should develop a strong sense of empathy for the higher self and the expression of its purpose. Being aware that the personality is but a transient structure which is adopted and energized by the soul as a means of its expression. And in accordance with an old axiom, we should learn to love where we are, who we are with, and what we are doing. We should be alive to the opportunities presented to us here to develop and express our spiritual qualities. Whether these opportunities come to us in the guise of privilege or privation. The soul is commonly depicted as a lotus-like structure, such as the one on the photograph here. The lotus of the soul is said to possess petals of knowledge, love and sacrifice which we unfold respectively through study of the occult classics, meditation, and service to humanity. These should be undertaken simultaneously, these practices. Now, the symbolism of the lotus is far from arbitrary. The lotus has its roots in the earth, representing our physical body or earthly base. Its stem grows in water, symbolizing the astral or emotional level of our being. And the lotus flower opens above in the air, representing the level of the mind and its importance in terms of our spiritual development and growth. The flower opens through its exposure to the rays of the sun, symbolizing our spiritual essence, the monad. The fact that the lotus is flowering above the water is most important. It indicates that we must develop the capacity to operate at a level above and beyond that of the emotions. We thereby avoid what the Hindus refer to as karma manas, a mind contaminated or driven by desire. It is desire which binds the soul to the wheel of rebirth and to the maya of the lower worlds, which Madame Blavatsky described as a magic lantern show. Desire arises through our attachment to transient objects and circumstances of the material world. We cannot express the immortal, enduring aspect of our being if, we are, if our efforts in life are based upon, driven by the pursuit of ephemeral matters. And this is a very important consideration as we tread the path. We must seek liberation from the hegemony of the astral body and its associated desires. So when we tread the path, <coughs> we are challenged towards transmuting the desires of the personality <coughs> so water there. I'll get some later. into spiritual aspiration. We must overcome our habits, impulses, prejudices and complexes so that the soul may energize us. And when we tread the spiritual path, a major emphasis is therefore placed upon emotional control and the transmutation of desire. The energies of the astral plane are focused upon the solar plexus chakra, which we see here. This is located in the region of the abdomen. The astral body synthesizes these energies so that we may use them effectively, either towards personal ends or in the, in the pursuit of desires, or we may use these energies towards creative and spiritual expression. And the key towards achieving the latter is through the transmutation of the energies of the solar plexus chakra into those of its higher counterpart, the heart chakra. We therefore seek to express heart chakra qualities related to the buddhic plane, whose qualities may be effectively summarized as love wisely applied, wisdom lovingly applied. 
We therefore seek to express unconditional and inclusive forms of love as opposed to selfish or jealous love. This does not mean, of course, that love of a personal nature is eliminated from our lives, but rather this is extended to the degree that ultimately it becomes universal. We seek to develop compassion and empathy, striving to recognize and understand the situations of others and the challenges which they face in endeavoring to express spiritual qualities. We seek to practice harmlessness, harmlessness in thought, word, and deed. The practice of harmlessness is a most effective antidote towards creating further challenging karma as we are confronted by various challenges in our lives, whilst it also serves to promote right human relations. The factor of discrimination when we tread the path is most important, another heart chakra quality. This relates to our ability to discern between the real and the unreal, or the spiritual and the transient. The practice of discrimination assists towards freeing us from the maya or illusion of the lower worlds so that we may express the qualities of the soul. And the final heart chakra, which I, quality rather, which I wish to mention is that of courage, which uh, Janet covered in the meditation with the wonderful quote from the voice of the silence. We must demonstrate the courage of the questing heroes of myth when we tread the spiritual path. This, of course, provides us with the means of overcoming fear. Fear being centered in the solar plexus chakra. So we must express courage as we tread the path. The challenges of the spiritual path are symbolized par excellence by the 12 labors of Hercules, which represent the challenges offered by the 12 signs of the zodiac on the soul's final uh, journey around its wheel. In common with many heroes of myth, Zeus, uh, sorry, Hercules <laughs> possesses dual parent parentage. His father is Zeus, who is divine, of course, and his mother is Alchemini. This represents the essential duality of humanity in that we possess a sp spiritual and a material aspect to our being. Probably the most famous of the labors of Hercules is assigned to incarnation in the sign of Scorpio, the confrontation with, with the Hydra. Hercules was instructed to destroy a nine-headed Hydra that dwelt by a festering swamp. He was advised that one of the Hydra's heads was immortal and that if any of the other heads were cut off, that two would grow in its place. It's a pity there wasn't a piano here. I could have played a scary minor chord there, you know, just as, a, as the picture comes up. <laughs> so to entice the Hydra from its lair, Hercules dipped his arrows into burning pitch and fired them into the cavern where it dwelt. The hydra which we see here emerged standing three fathoms high, spitting and breathing fire. It appeared to have been created from the foulest thoughts which humanity could conceive of. Just as he had been advised, when Hercules destroyed one head, another two emerged, and the monster seemed to grow stronger after each attack. Hercules then remembered the words of his teacher and sank to his knees and grasped the hydra and held it up to the light. The monster which was inv invincible in the darkness, mud and slime of the swamp, withered in the sunlight. And as it lay on the ground, Hercules observed the, mort the immortal head of the hydra and cut it off, buried it under a rock. The Hydra may be held to symbolize what in theosophy we describe as the dweller on the threshold, the sum total of our lower nature whose effects have been created over our many previous lives. The dweller is the aggregation of our fears, repressed, undesirable aspects of our character. It feeds upon our negativity and our fears. When we are able to destroy our individual dweller, we perform a great act of service on behalf of humanity in that we lessen the influence of the collective dweller of humanity anchored to the lower planes of the astral world. 
The hydra resides then within a dark swamp, symbolizing the subterranean regions of the human psyche, where the primal instincts, passions and lusts of humanity are located. And when we tread the path, if we, if we are overcome by these, if we succumb to them, we are faced with the danger of metaphorically drowning in the lower realms of the unconscious. It is only when we release our arrows of spiritual uh, aspiration that the presence of the dweller is revealed. As Madame Blavatsky stated, and as I said earlier, when one treads the path, all that is good and all that is evil surface. And we must be aware of this fact. We must recognize aspects of our own dweller in various situations in our lives. We must apply discrimination here to recognize its presence and confront and destroy what we encounter. We do this by focusing on the energies of the soul. We thereby strangulate the dweller on the threshold by cutting off its energy supply. The Hercules, when he confronted the Hydra in the swamp, amidst the mud and slime, he could not conquer it, just as we cannot overcome aspects of our lower nature by taking on it on at its own level, but rather when we move the, the problem or the combat to a higher spiritual dimension, the light and the wisdom of the soul is too much for the lower nature and the dweller to withstand. In theosophical literature this particular labor is related to what we refer to as the second initiation when the soul oriented personality is able to discipline control and transmute various desires towards spiritual ends it's worth noting that one of the heads of the monster was immortal and hercules buried it under a rock this symbolizing that despite its defeat in battle, at this stage of the evolutionary journey, the lower nature is still effective, the dweller is still there. It is by purifying the vibrations of our various bodies, by not engaging in thoughts driven by these lower levels of being, that we remain free from their influence. In the Herculean labor where the dweller is finally dispatched, and which Alice Bailey related to the third initiation, is symbolized by the slaying of Cerberus. This is a sign, of course, to the sign of Capricorn, the spiritual, uh, the, sorry, the zodiacal sign related to spiritual initiation. Hercules was required to rescue Prometheus, who had defied the gods by stealing their fire. However, this act enabled the progression and civilization of humanity. Zeus punished the transgression of Prometheus by assigning him to the kingdom of Hades where a vulture pecked at his liver. I couldn't actually find the source for Bailey's version of the myth because in Hesiod's Theogony it's a little bit different and where uh, Prometheus is not actually assigned to Hades but I'm just going along with the content of the Bailey book here. So Prometheus whom we see here may be viewed as a symbol for humanity. The vulture pecking at his uh, liver is symbolic of the five senses and the debilitating effects which they can exert upon the spiritual aspirant if they're unable to overcome the effects of karma manas or mind driven by desire. The senses here serve to engage one with the outer world of Maya, diverting one from their own spiritual intent. This emphasizes the importance of meditation, of course, when we shut down the five senses as a means of connecting with the higher self. Hercules is in the underworld, it's a common theme in myth, as a symbol for the unconscious, subjective realms of the human psyche. This is where, of course, the archetypal process of spiritual transformation takes place. And when we are able to transform the personality into an effective spiritual instrument, we overcome the desire nature and the five senses no longer serve to engage us in the pursuit of transient forms of satisfaction, but rather we function within the physical world in accordance with the intent of the soul, the higher self. So in this myth, after Hercules has uh, traveled along many labyrinthine paths, symbolizing, of course, hidden aspects of the psyche. There are many dead ends, blind alleys within the psyche when we tread the path. Hercules arrives at the court of Hades. 
Hades asks him what he is seeking in his realms and Hercules states that he wishes to free Prometheus. Hades advises Hercules that the path to, Promet to Prometheus was guarded by the three-headed dog Cerberus and that if he could overcome the creature, he could unbind the tortured hero. Hercules then confronts Cerberus and tightly grasps the monster's central head and despite the dog's demonic fury, Hercules is able to overcome it. This symbolizes the overcoming of the dweller and all that this entails when the dweller is deliberately confronted, recognized for what it actually is. This then enabled Hercules to free Prometheus. The act of freeing the suffering hero is symbolic of the spiritual aspirant by overcoming the dweller on the threshold in the lower nature, then being eligible to receive the fiery energies of spiritual initiation as the angel of the presence, the devic aspect of the causal body is revealed and where an alignment occurs between our spiritual essence, the monad and its instrument of expression, the soul. We witness parallels between this labor of Hercules and the myth of Theseus, where he enters the maze of King Minos, symbolizing the lower worlds and the labyrinthine realms of the human psyche. Here, it is the Minotaur which must be encountered and destroyed. It is blocking the center or source of one's being. So this has been a rather short and sweet synopsis relating to the spiritual path. Uh, I hope it has been of value to you. What I've sought to do is outline the general nature of it. Of course, it's, it is up to us as collective members of humanity when and how we shall undertake this evolutionary journey which leads to the very source of our being. There is a famous quote from Joseph Campbell which states that the goal of life is to make your heartbeat match the beat of the universe to match your nature with nature. And that is essentially what we are seeking to do when we tread the spiritual path. And each and every time that one of us decides to take the arduous, most challenging journey up the cliff face of the symbolic mountain of initiation, humanity draws closer to this objective. Thank you. <laughs>